Hi everyone and welcome to BioIVT's Admin 101 series. My name is Tina Muller and I'm the Scientific Advisor for Admin Talk Services here at BioIVT. Today I will present Admin 101, an overview of in vitro drug drug interaction or DDI studies. So let's get started with a quick introduction and a refresher of what ADMI is. As you probably know and remember, ADMI stands for Absorption, Distribution, Metabolism and Excretion. So it describes the fate of a drug once it enters the body and understanding ADMI characteristics is important in drug development as it helps to predict how a drug will behave once it is in the body. So the A in A ADMI stands for absorption, which is the process by which the drug enters the body and more specifically the bloodstream. As an example, drugs can be administered orally or via inhalation. The D stands for distribution. This process is defined as the reversible transfer of the drug from one location to another within the body. And then next we have metabolism, which most commonly occurs in the liver and involves enzymes. It changes the characteristics of the drug as well as its therapeutic effects. And then last is excretion, when the drug and the metabolites are eliminated from the body. So the main goal in drug development is to create a compound that has a therapeutic benefit and can be dosed to patients safely. This means developing drug candidates that have desirable ADMI properties. In vitro DDI studies are designed to investigate these ADMI properties. So in other words, drug-drug interaction studies will give answers to questions such as how stable is a drug candidate? What enzymes are involved in its metabolism? Are transporters affected? Answers to these questions support the selection of a lead candidate. They also predict potentially dangerous drug-drug interactions, or differently phrased, they assess what effect a drug candidate has on other drugs that are taken at the same time. Addressing potential DDI effects is a critical aspect of drug development and its safety evaluation. Now, the relevance becomes even more important if we consider that many adults in the US take at least one prescription drug and more than two thirds of adults 65 years and older take more than five prescription drugs. So what are DDI? What are the possible effects of drug-drug interactions? The figure here on the right illustrates that in a simple way. When a drug is taken at the same time as another drug, several things can happen. The drug is cleared faster from the body resulting in lower therapeutic effects. In contrast, the therapeutic effect could be higher or actually last longer if the drug is not metabolized. Or last, the drug could directly cause adverse effects. So to sum it up, any of these outcomes might be undesired. Now, getting back to why DDI studies are such a critical part of drug development, these mentioned points already provide a pretty good rationale. But in addition to generally gaining insights into what the ADMI characteristics are, in vitro DDI studies may also inform clinical study design. And last but not least, conducting these studies is needed to be compliant with regulatory guidance. And speaking of regulatory guidelines, here are three examples. On the left, there is the in vitro drug interaction studies, cytochrome P450 enzyme and transporter mediated drug interactions, the guidance for the industry by the FDA, which was finalized in 2020. To give you a quick excerpt of what it entails, and I quote, it says, evaluating the DDI potential of an investigation on new drug involves one, identifying the principal routes of the drug's elimination, two, estimating the contribution of enzymes and transporters to the drug's disposition, and three, characterizing the effect of the drug on enzymes and transporters. Now, similar language is found in the EMA guidelines, here shown in the middle, and most importantly, in the just approved ICHM12 document 
that has been adopted by the FDA. So now let's take a closer look at the studies that are part of these important DDI evaluations. There are three main areas, drug metabolism, drug metabolizing enzymes, and drug transporters. The first two assess metabolism and excretion, so M and E, while transporter studies evaluate absorption, distribution, and excretion, so A, D, and E. For drug metabolism, there are three main study types. Metabolic stability, that assesses the in vitro clearance of the drug. Then there is metabolite profiling and identification that, as the name suggests, profiles the metabolites and can propose biotransformation pathways of drug candidates. Last, we have reaction phenotyping, which identifies SIP enzymes that are involved in the metabolism of the drug candidates. For drug metabolizing enzymes, in this quick overview, we will focus on SIP inhibition and SIP induction, which evaluate the potential to inhibit or induce SIP enzymes respectively. And then last, in drug transporter studies, the drug candidates are evaluated for the potential of being either a substrate for a transporter or an inhibitor. So let's start and first look at the metabolism studies and what they entail. First, metabolic stability, an assay in which the in vitro metabolic clearance of a drug is assessed over time. Before I go into the details here, I would like to mention that in contrast to all other studies discussed in this video, metabolic stability is not required by regulatory agencies for an IND submission. With that said, it is often one of the first studies to be conducted as the results can aid in the selection of toxicology species, as well as other preclinical in vitro studies. Now, in a metabolic stability study, drug candidates are incubated in a test system, and most common are liver microsomes and hepatocytes, but there are others, such as, for instance, S9 or cytosolic fractions. Now, typically, metabolic stability is assessed in different species, and most often it is evaluated in human, mouse, rat, dog, rabbit, monkey, and or mini pig. The deliverables are the percent substrate loss, as you can see here on the right in those graphs, and the calculated intrinsic clearance, as well as the determination of the half-life, is done, if possible, as seen in the table at the bottom. So now moving on to metabolite profiling and identification, colloquially often called MET-ID, this study provides metabolite profiles and proposes biotransformation pathways. Structures of the major in vitro metabolites in different preclinical pre species are proposed and the data enable you to identify human specific metabolites or metabolites that are disproportionately high in humans. So dependent on the drug developmental phase of the program, the data can inform structure optimization determine potential reactive metabolites, and aid in the design of toxicology and other DDI studies. The drug candidate is again incubated in a test system, most typically liver microsome or hepatocytes, at a relatively high concentration. And as for metabolic stability, several species are evaluated, such as human, mouse, rat, dog, rabbit, monkey, and or mini pigs. The samples are then analyzed by LCMSMS to propose structures of the metabolites and create the metabolite profile for each of the species. Now, the last study type assessing metabolism of drug candidates is reaction phenotyping. This assay identifies metabolizing enzymes that are involved in drug metabolism and is considered a part of the victim potential evaluation. A victim also called an object, is a drug whose fate in the body is affected by the presence of another drug, and drugs with a single metabolic pathway have a high victim potential. Now, regulatory guidelines recommend using two approaches to evaluate reaction phenotyping, and typically 
that is incubation with human recombinant SIP enzymes and chemical inhibition of a SIP enzymes, again, most commonly done in liver microsomes. The results will show loss of the drug candidate for each of the evaluated SIP enzymes, of which typically seven are evaluated um, as seen in the bar graph on the left. For the second approach, SIP enzymes are inhibited with specific inhibitors and the effect on the metabolism of the drug candidate is determined. Now the report will provide the substrate loss for the recombinant enzyme as well as the percent inhibition if it was observed. Now let's switch gears and learn more about SIP inhibition and SIP induction. And let's start with SIP inhibition. To state the obvious, SIP enzymes are the major enzymes that are responsible for drug metabolism. And it is important to evaluate whether a drug candidate has the potential to inhibit these enzymes. In this context, I would like to bring up that SIP inhibition is evaluating the so-called perpetrator or precipitant potential of a drug candidate. We have talked about victim potential before and how other drugs can affect the metabolism of a drug. With SIP inhibition, we are now evaluating what effect a drug candidate could have on the metabolism of another drug. If a drug inhibits SIP enzymes, it may increase the toxicity risk with concomitantly administered medications. And knowing this inhibitory potential can assist with the design of clinical DDI studies. Now, typically, different types of inhibition are evaluated, namely direct inhibition, as well as time and metabolism-based inhibition. The effect is assessed at different concentrations and IC50 values are calculated if applicable. Follow-up experiments are conducted if time or metabolism-based inhibition is seen. Now, SIP inhibition is a major contributor to drug-drug interaction, and just to name two examples here to illustrate this point. Ketoconazole is a topical antifungal drug and a potent inhibitor of CYP3A4. This often precludes co-administration of drugs that are metabolized by 3A4. And similarly, Mibefadril is a non-selective calcium channel blocker used to treat hypertension and angina pectoris. It was removed from the market due to the potential for fatal DDI, mainly caused by SIP inhibition. So now let's look at SIP induction, another study that assesses the perpetrator potential. SIP induction evaluates whether a drug candidate induces the expression of SIP enzymes. If a drug is an inducer, it may alter the metabolism of itself or other drugs that are concomitantly administered. Now, regulatory guidelines suggest evaluating CYP1A2, 2B6, and 3A4, typically using QRT-PCR in three individual hepatocyte donors. If induction for CYP3A4 is observed, regulatory guideline recommends following up with an evaluation of CYP2Cs so 2C8, 9, and 19, assays which are often done using enzymatic activities. Now, if there is induction, as shown here in these graphs, an EC50 and an Emax or maximum fold induction can be calculated. Now, let's move to the last subject, transporters, and more specifically, transporter substrate and inhibition. Before we delve into the specifics of these studies, let me give you a brief overview of the most relevant clinical transporters and what role they play. Generally speaking, transporters play a major role in absorption, distribution, and elimination of drugs. And as you're probably aware, they are found in most tissues of the body, but most importantly for this talk, they are present in the intestine, liver, kidney, and brain. Now, there are two types of transporters important in this context, efflux transporters and uptake transporters. Efflux transporters are responsible for moving molecules out of the cells, whereas uptake transporters move the molecules into the cells. One example of an efflux transporter is PGP, which is expressed in most tissues 
and restricts the distribution of many drugs into organs. For instance, in the intestine, it affects the bioavailability of drugs, whereas in hepatocytes, it moves drugs, drug molecules into the bile. An example of a liver uptake transporter is OAT-P1B1, which moves organic anionic molecules from the blood into the hepatocytes. And as an example, statins are transported by OAT-P1B1. This brings us to the effect that drug, trans drug candidates have on transporters. They can either inhibit the transporters or be transported themselves. So in other words, Transporter studies determine whether drug candidates are transporter inhibitors or substrates. Data from transporter studies are used to figure out whether clinical DDI studies are needed. A second purpose is to make informed decisions whether patients can be enrolled in clinical trials if they take other medication. Now, these studies are typically conducted in cells. There are different cell lines used, such as KCO2 which are human colon cancer cells, MDCK2 cells, which are canine kidney cells, or HEC293 cells, which is a human embryonic kidney cell. The latter two cell lines are either stably or transiently transfected and express the transporter of choice. In addition, some transporter studies are performed using vesicles. The deliverables for inhibition is the percent inhibition and an IC50 is determined if possible. And you can see an example with OCT2 here on the left with a test article concentration on the x-axis and the percent activity on the y-axis. For substrate potential, the efflux or uptake ratio, depending on the transporter type, is determined as shown here in the middle panel for OAT-P1B1. It is also tested how a known inhibitor affects the movement of the drug candidate. So whether it is reduced, as shown on the right, where you can see that the uptake rate is lower compared to the one in the middle panel. With this, let me summarize the most important points of this presentation. DDI studies provide an understanding of the admin characteristics of drug candidates. With that, the results provide insights into the potential of a drug candidate to be a perpetrator or a victim. The results may also support dose and species selection for regular submission, such as an IND or first in human trials. As mentioned several times, these results can prepare for potential clinical DDI studies. And last but not least, Conducting these studies is critical in order to be compliant with regulatory requirements, and doing so at the right time in drug development will prevent delays. Which brings me to disclaimers and points that we are not discussed in this short video, but will need to be considered. First, these studies look rather simple to set up and interpret, but the reality could not be further from the truth and a deep understanding of the design and results is critical. There are also other in vitro ACME studies that often need to be conducted for a complete regulatory submission package. So for instance, just to name two, plasma protein binding and red blood cell partitioning, but there are others as well. Now also to simplify the subject, I focused on the SIP enzymes, but I want to emphasize that non zip enzymes are also often involved in drug metabolism and need to be evaluated similarly, if appropriate. And last, timing and prioritization of these studies varies and is based on drug class and de-risking strategy of the individual programs. With this, we are at the end of the short introduction into in vitro DDI studies. And here are some additional resources listed that can be found on the BioIVT website. And thank you very much for watching. And um, please reach out if you have any questions or of course, if you have any needs for in vitro DDI studies. Thank you.